As parents, we all know that it's a very bittersweet experience when we see a child leave. It doesn't matter where they're leaving to. It could be the first day of kindergarten. It could be they're going away to college. It could be they moved away because they have a job. Now imagine your child is leaving and being deployed in the military. While I was researching this book, Business Secrets from the Battlefield to the Boardroom, I found this quote, they called it a Marine Memo. This is what it said. Military parents, we wait daily, we worry daily, we miss daily, we cry daily, we pray daily. We get excited over a 12 second phone call. Now think about that parents, think about that. That statement describes the life of my next guest, Jeffrey and Patricia Dulce. Let's, let's meet them here. Now Jeff and Patty are parents of a military career army officer. Now since neither of them served in the military, this experience was new, it was very confusing. At times can be quite terrifying as I'll tell you. Now, both are contributing authors to my upcoming book, Business Secrets from the Battlefield to the Boardroom. And these are stories by veterans, by parents of veterans, by supporters and children of veterans. Okay, Jeff, Patty, welcome to Life Altering Events. Welcome. Well, yeah, thank you for having us. This is great. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, we wanted to get some rounding on this uh, on this book. I, uh, Patty and I grew up together for the, vo- the folks out there listening. And I was talking to her and she said, I was telling her about the book and she said, well, Frank, how many parents do you have in this book? And I went, oh my God, I didn't have any at the time. So they were gracious enough to, uh, to step up and, and, and write a, a chapter for us. Now, Patty, let me start with you. What was your initial reaction when your son said, I'm, I wanna join the army? To be perfectly honest with you, I was not happy. (laughs) But we talked in great length about the pros and cons. And we always told our children, whatever goal they set, they have to work hard at it. Knowing that he always wanted to fly helicopters. How do you say no to your son? Good answer. Jeff, what was your first take when he came back? You know, we we had talked about it prior to him making the final decision. Um, his his goal to fly was always very strong, and he um, looked at all of the pros and cons, the best way to do it. And he also had a big um, um, feeling toward join, joining the service. Uh, my father was in the military in the Korean War. He he spoke um, quite frequently with my father on issues with the war. He was a war buff. He was a history major. So it was in his blood at that point. He kind of had made the decision. I think the only decision he needed to make was, is he going to join the Navy or is he going to join the Army? Mm -hmm. He wanted to fly, and those were the two best options. Right. Uh, And he wanted ROTC. So ROTC said um, he had had the grades, he had the, the, the drive and the ambition. So obviously you want to do whatever you can for your, for your children and support them at that time. That was a decision he made and uh, we kind of accepted it. That's outstanding. A a very healthy approach. Uh, I went in the military. My mother cried, I think for two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just (laughs) try nine. Uh, Now this was, this is a new experience. And in, in your book, in your chapter, you wrote about, It's a whole different language. So not only do you have to learn your son's going to the military, but you don't even know how to talk to him anymore. What was that adjustment like? Well, you know, a lot of it is, especially with the Army, and I think it's it's a true fact with all branches of the military, is the acronyms. Mm -hmm. Um, Your son or daughter uh, speak in acronyms, um, and it's just a matter of understanding what those terms are. And sometimes he would get frustrated that we didn't know what he was talking about. We'd have to, you know, time out, tell us, tell us exactly yeah. what that means. Um, and we end up doing some Google searches and you know, <laughs> just just trying to get an idea of what these acronyms mean. And if you talk to a military veteran, I mean, you could hold an easy conversation with them. They're, they're so familiar with them. So that was the tough part. What was it for you, Patty? 
it was hard because I would stop him and say, please explain. And then he would get a little frustrated, like I should have known. Mm -hmm. And I had to say to him, Thomas, I don't know this language. Please explain it. And he would. Right. And after a while, we we finally acclimated ourselves to this. But even now, it's still a little. It, it, and it's funny that he got married um, halfway through his his career. And his wife-to-be was non-military, didn't know very much about it. And, and she, she hooked up for this, this <laughs> incredible ride. And it's amazing how fast, obviously, yeah. she picked up on it. And those two having a conversation at dinner <laughs> with us was just, it's like meeting somebody from a different world, you know, having this total different conversation. And then she would actually get a little frustrated, like, you know, don't you know what we're talking about? So, yeah, it's 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 an interesting uh, uh, issue to have to deal through. But when he became major, she had to um, take over. I can't remember exactly what she had to do. Well, oh. there, there's a group called the FRG, right. which I think you're familiar with. Right, yes. that's what it was. The Family Readiness right. Group. Um, and as the commanding officer, it's usually the spouse that handles the FRG to, to keep all of the parents and siblings and spouses and everybody up to date on the, the comings and goings and the doings, especially after a deployment um, in the States, the FRG group would, would be a big part of that. So um she did not want to do that, but she had to basically because it was, it was supposed to be her job. So she she obviously when she undertook it, it was phenomenal. She she dives in with both feet and just took over and, and a fantastic opportunity for her to. Yeah. What, what was it like connecting with them? Because uh, as parents, you have support groups for everything. You have a support group when your kids go to school, who's going to pick them up when they go to college, you create some. How did you find a support group when going to the military? This is not a normal course of action. It was his commanding officer. His wife is the one who was in charge of it. Mm -hmm. And as it was getting closer from him coming back from Iraq, which is a whole different story, um, we ended up just talking with Thomas because we were over. She was overwhelmed because they. They were supposed to come on this date and, you know, you're at, you wait for the military and it's, you know, they'll tell you this date and it ends up being canceled. And so now you have to wait for another date. Um, but we just kept constant connection with Thomas. Well, that's the thing, too. The technology today is, is so far advanced right. from your and our, our day, you know, the right. Vietnam days and trying to talk to friends and relatives that served, again, with your opening monologue with the 12-second phone call um, today with the Zoom and the cameras and the videos and the technology and everything is instant. It's just, just you've got almost an instant connection. So it's a, it's a big difference, which thank God for that. But these support groups and these FRG groups and, and all of the avenues available to you uh, using today's technology, thank God for that, because it does keep that link, you know. It's outstanding. And the what was the best advice the support group gave you? What, what was the one thing that they said to you that helped you fe become calm or, relax, or more relaxed? You're never relaxed, but more relaxed. I don't really think we connected with them. Well, I, I think a lot of it was learning that the military is a lot like the airlines. You know, don't set your, your watch on a military time table. Um, if something were to happen today at 1,400 hours, it's not going to happen. I mean, right. it's, it's, you're talking about a delay or you're talking about so many unforeseen circumstances. So I think those were big factors is the learning the patience Um if something's going to happen, and in the case of, uh, again, a good example is his return trip from Iraq after a one-year um, stint, and he was supposed to come back on a specific day. It was eight to nine days later. I mean, just waiting for that plane to touch back in American soil, it's just a tremendous amount of patience involved with that. Nerve-wracking, I would imagine. Yeah. Yes, that was. Wow. So this is a question I always like to ask, uh, particularly mothers. Sons don't want to worry their parents. 
and you're going to the military. So they don't tell you a lot of stuff. So mm-hmm. was there someone in the family that he would sort of confide in and talk about what was going on and then have that person try to break the news to you? His sister. They are very close. Even to this day, they, um, they're very close. We knew he was going to jump out of an airplane. This was part of it. He always wanted to do that. Um, but he would call Kristen and he would tell her, I jumped out of an airplane. And so he would call us and I would call Kristen and I said, he jumped out of an airplane. She goes, yeah, I know. I said, <laughs> okay. Um, he would tell her, he would call her in the middle of the middle of the night and tell her what he was doing. And then he would tell us. So we wouldn't worry. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) And I would say, Thomas, you know, you can tell us. He goes, I just don't want you to worry. I said, we worry every day. I said, please just tell us. But he, he would tell Kristen, which is fine. Well, as a, as a medevac helicopter pilot, he did some, some things that, you know, you don't normally want to open up to, to your parents, uh, Obviously, during his training and getting his wings uh, as far as um, parachute school uh, or, or landing a helicopter on a pitching deck of an aircraft carrier is, is scary enough as it is. Yeah. So he would, we knew that it was happening. He just didn't know when or he didn't tell us when. So we wouldn't worry that he'd always tell us after. You know? yeah. mm-hmm. Still here. Everything is fine. Yeah. And he and he also confided with his sister and he would also confide with with my father, who was also uh, a medevac um, in Korea, uh, not obviously flying, but he was on the ground. And so he would confide in my father as well. Some of the things that he had seen or done in Iraq that only my father would understand. Um, obviously, us as parents couldn't even imagine some of the sights that he must have seen. So exactly, I'm glad that they were both there for him so that he'd have at least somebody to talk to. Yeah. Now, were you able uh, to, to go to any of his duty stations and visit him? Mm-hmm. Everyone, except when he was deployed. Um, well, I think I did a tally this morning, and, and he joined in 2006. And uh, he's been to, I believe, 11 specific locations since then. Oh, the Washington. I mean, he's done... Uh, his home base and some of his training is, you know, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, um, Fort Rucker, Alabama is the flight school. Um, he did some training and some some college courses at Fort Leavenworth for a year. Uh, his last group was down at Fort Knox, which was nice. It's, it's only a five hour drive from us. And the nice thing about living in Chicago is we're able to to get to some of these places relatively quick within a day or two. Um, I think our favorite was the, uh, Fort, the Fort Drum uh, in, in yeah. upstate New York. Obviously, us being from Western New York, it gave us an opportunity to visit family and relatives and friends and uh, get there one day and then back up into Fort Drum, which was Watertown, New York, in about five hours. So I think that was one of our favorites. Yeah. Um, that's the base they lived on, all the other base. Well, they lived. They lived in all of the bases, obviously, except for the ones for his, you know, quick training right. or his deployment. Did you go to anyone except for like Iraq? Did you go to any of his overseas uh, locations? No, we no. did not. No. We're, we're we're trying to plan a trip to. He's currently in Germany right now for three years, and uh, or we'd like to t- plan a trip to at least get there now uh, while he's stationed in Germany. We had uh, one of the people we interviewed said the one of the, one of the highlights of, of being deployed and, and returning is when the plane lands and they're all in formation right, as they get off the plane and then they're dismissed and everyone starts looking for their family. What was that moment like? Well, we never had that because when he came back from Iraq, um, he had to bring back five helicopters and 20 men and it was on an air force plane and he calls us and he said we're in Spain and I said Spain he said yeah 
he goes there. He thought they were changing crew. They were changing planes. Mm -hmm. Now they had to take all these helicopters off the plane, which takes a lot of work and a lot of hours. So then from Spain, he took off from Spain and half halfway over the ocean, they blew a ninja. And they were afraid to wake up my son because when he takes command, he takes command. Mm -hmm. And he said, put us down at the closest place, which was Newfoundland, right? Yeah, some St. John, St. John, Canada, yeah, or wherever was north. And, and they landed in some small airport. They didn't even think they could get the C 130 aircraft on the airfield, but they had to get it down. So, and he was stuck there for a couple of days and uh, he got his, his men back to the States using commercial aircraft, but he stuck, he stayed behind with the, with the vehicles. Right. So he landed on the States back, I think it was Fort Campbell, Kentucky right. was his home base at the time. He was like him and a handful of people off the plane and there was nobody there. And I believe it was for, for Kentucky, it was a, a two inch snow for them. It was like a snowstorm. Yeah. It was. And so we drove at what, four in the morning to meet him. And it was just us at the airport. So we never had that return. And when he came back from uh, Iraq, it was uh, his wife and, and two sons at the time. And we, we weren't there for that. But I can only imagine what that was like. Um, mm -hmm. Not Iraq. He came back from Germany. He was in Germany on an uh, Eastern European mission with NATO. So it was the Germany trip that he returned that uh, was the big fanfare and, you know, all of the the family waiting and uh, the kids with the signs and it, it would, it looked like that could be quite a joyful, obviously experience. So. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was, I was excited to see him when he came back from Iran. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We were so bad. We didn't know where we were going. <laughs> and I'm telling Jeff, I said, turn here. And so he turns there and we were over grass and over curbs <laughs> and, <laughs> and my son, you know, he's fine. Well, the base was completely oh, dark. Yeah. And the roads obviously don't get plowed. And so everything's white. And, and we could see the plane and the airfield. And we were just heading toward it. And <laughs> it seemed like we were we were driving <laughs> driving over curves. I and, didn't care where we were going as long as I got to see it. Yeah. yeah, the military bases aren't, aren't uh, the roads aren't posted real well. As you know. the base. So now he's been in... 15 years, they're about? Um, no. no, it'll be 16. It'll 16 be, years. Yeah, yeah, 16, 17 years almost. Yeah. You know? so, so you're you're all pros now in, in, the, in the military life. What, what would you say to a new parent whose uh, child is just going into the military? What advice would you give them? Well, I probably would tell them to make sure you tell them that you love them, that you're proud of them leave a note in their computer bag because that's the first thing they look at, which I always did, which we always did. I always wrote a note. Um, and make sure you keep constant contact, send packages, letters, and just be there for them when they call. That's what we did. Yeah, first thing you do is open up a UPS or yes. a, a parcel service account. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be doing a lot of mailing of packages. We still do. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and most likely you have to use the United uh, States Post Office because they're usually in an APO, you know, uh, box if, if they're overseas, obviously. So um, it's just amazing what we spend on packages. <laughs> just Exactly. But no, obviously, supporting your child in any endeavor is really the key, you know, and it's regardless of how individuals feel about the military, uh, it's still a noble position, especially in today's society. Um, it's not the it's not the military you and I grew up with, um, where if you really didn't know what you wanted to do with your life, you know, join the military. Right. Today, you have to qualify. I mean, they want college kids. They want college graduates. They want uh intelligent people um it's not that easy to get in especially to get some of the jobs that you think you want and right one of the reasons he chose the army was because um obviously coming through rotc and, and getting the financial help to get through school um he had 
many, many opportunities for, for different jobs within the Army, where the Navy, basically the Navy ROTC says, you're coming out as a commissioned officer, either you're a captain on a ship, you're a captain on a submarine, or if you're uh, qualified and, and, and you can do the Navy aviation, that's that's the key. So you have like three options in the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to fly. The medevac pilot, he did a lot of research. Flying helicopters was one that he felt that he could get in. And, and obviously he got in and he's loved it ever since. So, yeah. But again, it's just the support of your child, no matter what endeavor they have. Those, uh, what we used to call care packages, uh, mean the world when it arrives in your uh, even if you're not overseas or you're just somewhere stationed and it kind of thing yeah. comes from home and it's it's like a feeding frenzy okay mm -hmm. you have to in my case you have to open it up and take what you want quickly because right. it's going to be gone in a matter of seconds and so did, it's, it's it, go ahead Patty. he did say mom pack extra because i guess they have a, a conference room and so I would send Pizzelli's, peanut butter cookies, caramel corn, everything that I could. And I would have a separate package just for him. <laughs> and he, they always asked for um, dryer, the dryer, um, oh, the, the, the sheets. Yeah, the, and I asked, the sheets. why? And he said, because they change them out for the air conditioning because of the dust. Right. And so I would send boxes of those. Well, just anything I could think of. Toilet paper. Oh, and toilet paper. And toilet paper. And I'm still sending toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. It must have been interesting okay. during the uh, during the pandemic scare and all that, trying to find it. That's wild. Yeah. Actually, when he was in Fort Levin with Kansas. Um, they did have a toilet paper emergency around that area where they could not get it, just like everywhere. Yeah. And we were fortunate enough here in, in Chicago. Um, then, of course, we were fighting the shelves <laughs> along with everybody else. So when we get our hands on some, we would send them. Even when he was here in the States, they couldn't find it. So right. part of his care package was toilet paper. Um, it was a necessity, obviously, for him and his, his growing families. So. I was at Costco the day because Jeff knew about it because of the CTA and what he was informed. So he called me and called Kristen and I stocked up. And when I was there, I was watching people just fill their carts. And, you know, I bought what I needed and maybe a little extra. And I was glad because I, we were shipping it to Kansas. It was ridiculous. They should have put a limit on them. Right. Right. So you're just about done. Does he intend to stay past 20 years or is he is 20 years going to be it? We talked about that when they were here because they were with us for a full month. It was so good. <laughs> it, was, it was hard. It was so hard to see them leave. Um, he didn't know what he wanted to do, where he wanted to live. And we felt that because of his background, he wouldn't have a hard time. And I've always told him, I said, go into teaching. And he goes, why would I do that? And I said, Thomas, you teach every day. You train people. You talk to people. You do conferences. What do you think you're doing? And he stopped and he said, oh, yeah. And I think I told you that he was accepted um to be certified as a teacher he's taking Excellent. classes and i was just like, yeah. <laughs> well he gets he gets his promotion in april to um lieutenant colonel lieutenant colonel and now he's going to probably be we should be eligible for a battalion command at some point in time so if he gets his battalion command or he's scheduled or slated for a battalion command uh, within the next three years, then he'll probably stick out another five uh, oh. because that would be um, ultimately the way to go uh, for him. If not, then he'll he'll just going to revisit it and he'll hit the 20 and then make his decision. He is, he's going to get his teacher certificate. He's got a 
a couple of masters and some bachelors. So he's, he should be fine in terms of what he chooses to do. Uh, unlike um, a, a lot of people that are a little confused coming out, but we're hoping that he makes the, the decision that's going to be comfortable for him and his family. I loved your statement, Patty, that you had been for a whole month. I did. It was every morning. Um, the boys would jump in bed with us. And um, they always wanted to watch the weather. So I would fire up the iPad and we would watch the weather. Um, what else did we watch? Oh, I don't know. Um, I can't remember. But every night I read a story. And we just, it was just fun to to have, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I love my family dearly, but to have the boys, you know, Harrison was always first and then George and then Noah and all five of us are cuddled in this bed. And I'm like this much from the end, but we would watch different things, but they were always interested in the weather, which I was confused about. I think they were just, Happy to be in bed with you and us, you know. That's <laughs> grandma and grandpa. Exactly. Uh, they, you know, you were watching the weather and they kind of hopped on and they went, oh, yeah, what's this for? But, uh, yeah, the, the three boys um, uh, are quite a handful for them. Um, seven, five, and three, I believe. So, no. Eight. Um, wow. Or eight, eight. eight, six, and almost four. I mean, it's, it's yeah, that's, it's a new experience for them all now in Germany. It's a great opportunity for them. So. And they're begging us to come. Yeah, we got to get out there and see them. <laughs> you know why they're doing that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Don't watch the weather, Tim. <laughs> to watch yeah. the now, the chapter you wrote, you said, uh, always saying goodbye. Now, you've been doing this for 16 years. Does yeah. it ever get easier to say goodbye? No, this was the hardest. This was really hard because when he was in um, Germany, um, Lisa and the two boys stayed with us and um, we loved it. And I, Thomas asked, he called, he goes, mom, he goes, you know, I'm going. And I knew what he was going to ask. And I said, yes. And I said, as long as Lisa's comfortable with it, you know, to be with us and, I was there for her and she would go home, you know, and spend a couple days with her mom. And, um, but yeah, I loved it. We loved it. Didn't we? And that's when she would go back to Watertown just to check on the house. And then she'd come back. She, um, she spent a summer with us at the cottage and she came back. And I think we made a very comfortable home for her and the boys. And it helped her to get through it. Yeah, they were they were a lot litter, a little a littler and um she know, needed the help. She at that time it was just the two boys. So he was stationed in Germany and Eastern Europe. Um so we were we were there to help. But saying goodbye is is I mean it's just whether you're saying goodbye uh to go to college, you know, obviously he 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 did he wasn't that far from us. Um, he went to Marquette University, which is only about a ninety minute drive for us from Chicago. So we got to see a lot of them. But to say goodbye to somebody going off to college, uh, say across country, or saying goodbye to somebody leaving for the service, or um, yeah, it never gets easy. You know, it's it gets harder. And um, so we're hoping those days will be over soon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the reasons I think we moved to Chicago from Western New York was uh, we were strongly family oriented and, and growing up with our grandparents and Sunday dinners and keeping the cousins together and the aunts and uncles. Uh, Western New York going through the problems that it was faced uh, back in the 70s uh, did not look like a place to be. Yeah. The opportunities in Chicago were greater that we could take advantage of here and, and at some point in time hopefully all of our kids would stay and be close and um so we'll see where he ends up i don't think he wants to come back to the chicago area but we'll see you were here before me standing yeah remember western new york at that period of time it was 
I see I, I run into a lot of people from Western New York and uh, they'll, they'll say uh, it's a good place to be from. Yeah. yeah. Particularly at that time when we all had to leave. Well, we all wanted bigger and better things. Exactly. I mean, there was no opportunities there for us. When you think about it, everything was falling apart. And Absolutely. in fact, someone posted on Facebook, one of my friends said, this is not a safe place anymore. They're having multiple issues with guns and drugs. And I don't know. Not a good state. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're just about out of time here. I want to thank Jeff and Patty for sharing the ups and downs of a military parent. Those of you who are parents, I want you to really listen to what they had to say. It is your child may be the one serving, but you're also serving. And, and you almost feel helpless that there's nothing you can do, but you have to just be there and support them. And that's the magic. If you want to read their story. It's going to be coming in and from several other veterans and parents and children and supporters. The book Business Secrets from the Battlefield to the Boardroom will be released on March 29th. Mark your calendar, March 29th. You do not want to miss this book. Now, you can see this show on Roku TV or on my YouTube channel, which is also named Frank Zakari. If you go to the YouTube, please subscribe. Let me leave you with this, as I do every week. None of us are in this alone. And the secret to walking on water is to know where the rocks are. And if you're a military parent, Jeff and Patty showed you where most of those rocks are today. Join me next week for another life-altering event. Jeff and Patty, thank you again. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Thank you.